under the influence of illusion. And that illusion uh, becomes deeply ingrained to an extent that it becomes the standard, the social norm, the traditional uh, norm. Let's take a look at this subject from the viewpoint of yoga psychology. We all know what it is to dream at night. Your body is laying in bed and your mind can be thousands of miles away. And you can be dreaming that you're in so many exotic situations of both happiness and distress. If you've ever been in the same room with someone who has who's having a nightmare, you see their physical reactions. And to that person having the nightmare, it's for real. But you're watching the person, you're awake, and you understand there's nothing to fear at all. Night dreams, we're aware of those things. But what the yoga, psychology teaches us is that when we wake up in the morning we don't actually fully wake up we enter the daydream so at night you are dreaming that maybe who knows you are ceo of hb or you are president of the usa or you're undergoing some torture excruciating situation. When you so-called wake up, you actually don't wake up. You enter into the daydream. And the difference between the daydream and the nightdream is that the daydream is more substantial. I'll explain what I mean by that later. Just think, the alarm clock rings and you so-called wake up and you think, I am the body, I am the mind, I have a certain gender, I have a certain occupation, I have certain goals to achieve. So from the viewpoint of the Krishna text, in terms of yoga psychology, you actually haven't awakened. You've changed from one dream to another. The daydream is more substantial in that it involves what Bhagavad Gita calls gross matter. Uh, you see, the approach of Bhagavad Gita is to consider matter in two basic divisions, gross and subtle. So, uh, gross matter uh, refers to mm, the kind of stuff that the science and technology deals with today. And subtle matter in Bhagavad Gita refers to that dodgy parapsychological stuff, <laughs> which no one wants to admit exists. <laughs> Krishna and Bhagavad Gita describes that subtle matter as mind, intelligence, and false ego. Uh, <laughs> so, the night dream is predominantly, in terms of how you experience it, a subtle matter affair. You see, from the viewpoint of yoga psychology, <clears throat> subtle matter, although subtle, it, it's, it gives sensations, just like gross matter gives sensations. So when you wake up, you're dealing with gross matter. You're, you're trying to move and shake the gross material energy. Again, please remember, gross material energy refers to the stuff that science and technologists deal with. You're trying to manipulate that in order to bring about fulfillment and satisfaction for your body 
and mind. So what we're going to deal with today is particularly why we have accepted this mission to interact with matter for the purpose of fulfillment. And then, of course, we have to focus on the question of <laughs> who are we anyway? Once we start focusing on that, then we can begin to see what the illusion is all about. Sometimes social psychologists use a term called mass consensual trance. It's not a mainstream social psychological term, but uh, those on the, shall we say, edge in social psychology use that term. It's possible, in other words, that masses of people can consent to be in a trance of illusion. So let's look at that possibility. We can use some terms that are common to social psychologists, but you'll find that the Krishna texts have their own spin on these terms in terms of how they're applied. Disorientation. You, know, you all know what it's like to be oriented. But to be disoriented means that you can't properly get a bearing on your time, place, and circumstances. And you can't recognize people properly. Uh, time, place, circumstance, people, it all becomes difficult to distinguish. This is dealt with, surprisingly enough, by Krishna and Bhagavad Gita. Uh, when we become overrun by a conception that we are gross matter and that we are also subtle matter, we lose our ability to see the spiritual reality. It all becomes mythology for us. There's so many things about material nature that require education and training to see. I'm sure you can readily experience how you may look through a microscope at some biological specimens, but unless you've been trained, you won't recognize what you see. Indeed, uh, <clears throat> there have been studies done, scientific studies done about the sociology of looking into a microscope. You depend on what you hear to recognize the patterns that you see. Otherwise, without being educated, what you're seeing through the microscope, make no, it makes no sense to you. What Krishna proposes in Bhagavad Gita is that if you indeed want to see something non-material, then education and training is required. Personally, I don't find that to be so outlandish. One uh, professor of quantum mechanics at Harvard told me that it takes an average of seven years to train students to see things <laughs> through the quantum mechanics point of view uh, because it's so contrary to their ordinary habits of perception. You have to be initiated, in other words. You have to go through a, a, a process to prepare you to visualize and deal with conceptually. That is uh, a very different realm. Well, Krishna in Bhagavad Gita is proposing that you enter the Bhakti Laboratory. 
at the almost said laboratory because I spend <laughs> five months of the year in an Australian New Zealand. I'm both an American citizen and New Zealand citizen. So Bhagavad Gita is presenting a laboratory in which you can <clears throat> apply your faculties and come out with perceptions which are described in Bhagavad Gita. This is what attracted me to <clears throat> what is known in the West as Krishna consciousness and what is known in India as Bhakti. I didn't want religious beliefs. I wanted uh, laboratory procedures in which I could verify the non-material identity of a living entity. I could verify the existence of a non-material energy. And I could make progress in connecting with the source of the material energy and non-material energy. In other words, I wanted, I wanted serious business. <laughs> Since that time when I began 40 years ago, I've traveled on every continent of the world except Antarctica. I've been doing that for about three decades. And I've been uh, researching the non-material energy and presenting findings as I travel around the world. My last month at Yale, I told my dean that I didn't really see a, a place for myself uh, in a material culture. And he was a wise man. He looked me dead in the eye and said, you are a Yale man, you will influence the world. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he was a little bit right in a way that he didn't anticipate. In any case, when I address this theme of mass illusion, mass consensual trance, uh, I'm fully aware that <clears throat> We're cutting very, very deeply. If we look at what Bhagavad Gita presents, we find disorientation at the deepest level, the inability to recognize how time is affecting us in terms of plundering our, our life, we don't take that as an overriding important factor. It's just something that goes on in the background. As far as the direction of our life, we'll get into more of that later, but are we really on top of the direction of our life? And do we actually recognize people for what they are? Do we simply see them as matter? Or do we see them as spiritual entities encased in matter? I generally like to quote a statement by someone who's arguably the most well-known scientist amongst laypersons, you know, Mr. Hawking. Uh, he says, I love the statement, just face it. You're simply chemical scum on a moderate-sized planet. So I hope you're all ready to face that. <laughs> and from the viewpoint of Bhagavad Gita, this is depersonalization, in which the individual's self-awareness is disrupted in the world of psychology, depersonalization simply refers to a sense of disconnection from yourself. You're watching yourself act and do things and you can't recognize the person. Who is that who's doing this? Who is that who's thinking like this? Everything looks like a dream, so hazy. Uh, 
persons who are suffering from depersonalization find it very difficult to remember anything they saw or experienced while they're in the third person, meaning they're looking at some other person uh, doing things, and so it's yourself, but you can't remember that. Uh, it's a very uh, anxiety-ridden uh, state of being. But if we look at depersonalization from the viewpoint of yoga psychology, we find that everyone, practically speaking, suffers from it because they're not aware of their identity as a unit of spiritual consciousness, part of the Supreme Consciousness. Instead, mm, their spiritual identity has been shoved into the background and some other temporary entity is has been given power of attorney and is trying to act in this world for temporary goals. Let's move on to consider the term about de-individualization. De the standard definition is you're treating other people as if they are their ethnicity, their gender, their creed, uh, Bhagavad Gita will go much deeper that when you treat someone as if they're the body and mind then you actually totally obliterated their individuality now why would we want to treat persons in that way number one we don't know any better due to the mass consensual trance and number two this conception will make it easy for us to achieve our material goals. I am the body, I am matter, so it's very conducive for you to be matter because uh, I need material experiences to fulfill and satisfy me. If I start to consider that you are a unit of spiritual consciousness, well, what do I do with that? <laughs> what practical experience, what practical purpose do you serve? Uh, so I hope now you're starting to see how uh, the yoga texts explain this cloud of illusion and how it affects everyone. It's all about utility. I don't want to see you as anything other than matter because that ruins your utility for me. <laughs> Often I get the question in traveling around the world, well, what does a so-called spiritual entity do anyway? What's the economic function? <laughs> does it vote? <laughs> does it consume? <laughs> Where do we get this notion that we are simply matter? The fact that we have consciousness alerts us to alerts us to that something strange is going on. As you know, there's not one scientific instrument in the world that can directly detect the presence of consciousness. You'll find that scientists fall into roughly three groups when dealing with consciousness. One group says consciousness is a material phenomenon. There's no doubt about it. Uh, it can all be understood in terms of uh, brain activity. This is a religious statement because there's no proof for this. Then you have those who say uh, probably will never understand what consciousness is. It's outside the scope of science as we know it. And then there's a third group that says, let's just face it, we don't know what's going on. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna makes a very interesting point that consciousness is an energy that indicates the presence of the non-material entity. So you can actually ride in through consciousness 
understanding what is consciousness, and then you can ride into the awareness of the non-material identity. And that's actually one of the preliminary goals of the yoga system. How to get awareness of your non-material identity by first becoming aware of consciousness as a symptom of non-material identity. So what Bhagavad Gita is presenting is that there's much more to yoga than just the exercises and the breathing, which is all good for health. I do it myself. But there's much more to be had. Now let's consider how much are we responsible for our actions. Are we really the purposeful entities that we think we are, that due to our individual qualities known as internal determinants, that's what makes our life the way it is. Consider that there may be a bit of a religious creed in operation here in which the individual is made out to be so responsible. There are evil individuals, there are very virtuous individuals, and probably most people are in between. So that uh, you don't consider the situation. There's a divide between understanding disposition and understanding situation. Those who cling to a dispositional understanding of human behavior, they very much stress uh, your genetic background, uh, the uh, makeup of your personality. Those who lean to the situational side say that, let's face it, change your circumstances, your situation, to something very uh, different than what you've ever experienced before, and your disposition will change in ways that can shock you. In other words, we're not as robust in terms of our material core identity as we think we are. There's a scale, and if we just change the circumstances, the situations, there can be radical changes in our behavior. Indeed, we can become, mm, uh, we can perform acts that we never think, we never would have thought to, we could do. That means even great evil. How this relates to the mass consensual trance? In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna explains that there is an energy of illusion that affects the living entities who choose to forget their core spiritual identity and instead they want to identify with matter. Once that crucial mistake is made, once you jump into that river, you're swept away. That's the main reality that's going on. And then the details are the particular situations you encounter while in the matrix of illusion. So the yoga texts are trying to take our vision away from being so preoccupied with the small scene and instead transfer our vision to the big picture. There is an energy of illusion that's causing this mass identification with the body and mind as a self. So much so that we spend our whole life pursuing material fulfillment and we sacrifice our chance for spiritual experience and development. Well, I'm not really talking about religious belief. I'm talking about how we can get the tools and the laboratory experience when we apply those tools for actually understanding the non-material self. That's the first step Krishna gives in Bhagavad Gita. 
And then the graduate step is to understand the non-material source of the non-material self. So in the Western world, this is called Krishna consciousness. In India, it's called bhakti yoga. This term yoga, I'm sure you've heard before, refers to connection. So what is the ultimate connection? There's an energy of illusion that prevents us from addressing that. We become falsely empowered with the uh, necessity for material achievement and material enhancement. It's good to ask ourselves the question from time to time. Where did I, who embedded this chip in me? <laughs> <laughs> who turned me on in this way? <laughs> Why? <laughs> but it's a difficult question to ask. Why? Because you'd be going against the grain. And to go against uh, such a flow is, is difficult. You have so much pushing against you. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't try to escape. Be satisfied with what I like to call cookie cutter consciousness. Uh, there are different types of cookies. So, <laughs> which, which type of cookie do you want to eat? We have a, we have a cutter that will uh, facilitate you. Let's give some results of research here. There was an analysis at Princeton University of 25,000 social psychology studies. 25,000 were analyzed. And the conclusion was that almost everyone is capable of torture and other evil acts if placed in the wrong social context. This is the result of analyzing 25 social psychology experiments. You know, with computers, all this is possible. Mm. So we tend to focus on the individual. What is it about you that made you do such wrong, such horrors? Or what is it about you that made you do such good, uh, an heroic act? But if we understand the power of the situation, uh, we get uh, a deeper insight into what we're capable of being, what we're capable of doing. Let's look at suicide bombers. Naturally, you would think such persons are come from desperate, poor backgrounds, psychotic backgrounds, uh, very perverse persons who would uh, strap a bomb to themselves and then blow themselves up in a public place. Uh, well, we're in for a surprise. Forensic psychologists from the West have studied uh, up, upwards of 400 Al-Qaeda members, and what they found was shocking. They are well-educated. The majority of them are university graduates. They come from caring, loving homes. They're married. Most of them have children. Uh, in fact, one forensic psychologist said, they're not simply normal, they're the best. So what happened? How is it that persons can be twisted in such a way to become a suicide bomber? They're recruited, first of all. Observers are watching rallies. Who has the most patriotic fervor? Who is against the foe in the most intense way? Because these suicide bomber candidates have a strong sense of injustice. So once they're observed, they're invited to meetings. And they're analyzed. How much do you love your particular region and you hate that particular foe? 
How much? How much? And those who really mm, ring the bell, they receive training. How to make bombs, how to carry out the mission. And then something called the brotherhood mentality takes over. You're told that you have to be responsible to all your group members. You're all in this together. You can't let one another down. And then to further seal your commitment, uh, a video is taken of you with a particular religious book in one hand and a rifle in the other, and that video is sent to your family. And this is when your family first understands that you're going to become a living martyr. Uh, that's the term you're called before you carry out your mission. You're a martyr, you're still living right now. So then, your, your family feels very prestigious. Before you execute your task, pictures are taken of you to put on posters all over the city so that if you're successful in your task, uh, you'll be made a hero after your death and, your, and the <clears throat> photo monuments of yourself will inspire others to take up the cause and do, do as you have done. A pension is guaranteed for your family, an ample pension. So all the, all the bases are covered. Now, there has to be some theological uh, incentive. You're told that once you do this suicide bombing, you'll sit on the right hand of God you'll get a favored place, not only for you, but also for your family. And moreover, there's no need to worry about the pain of the explosion, because, uh, you know, there are nails and other horrible things in the bomb, but that won't hurt you, because as soon as, even before one drop of your blood touches the ground, God will intervene protect you. You won't feel anything. Actually, you'll just immediately feel pleasure due to your situation in heaven. So all these inputs are there and the person becomes transformed enough to do what we all recognize as a very horrible, abominable thing. Another study was done uh, by French scholars and they, and they went into the jails, into the prisons, to interview uh, suicide bomber candidates who were caught before they could execute their task. And in every case, these persons were saying that <clears throat> we're doing this for the highest motivation. We're not doing evil, we're doing the greatest good. They actually felt that way. So the amazing thing is how flexible or plastic our convictions can be. We're not as individualistic and cohesive as we think. If you go on Google, and put in the word experiment, guess what comes up in the top three or four positions? The infamous Stanford experiment of 1971. <laughs> in which uh, a social psychologist wanted to see what it would be like to simulate uh, prison conditions. So he recruited some Stanford students to be in the role of prison guards and some Stanford students to be in the role of prisoners. And he had them play out the role. And his idea was he would observe, as a behavioral scientist, I'll observe and I'll get 
some conclusions. What happened though, the experiment was supposed to run for two weeks and he had to stop it after six days because everyone participating in the experiment really got into it. They lost themselves into, the, into their roles. And you Stanford students, they're not just, you know, <laughs> person straight off the street. Those students playing the role of guards became very sadistic. Those students playing the role of prisoners became severely stressed uh, to the point of psychological damage. The professors had to stop the experiment. And the professors admitted they themselves were getting caught up in all this, so much so that they lost their perspective and they couldn't properly detect that the experiment was getting out of hand. They were getting fascinated by the, uh, the potential for sadism and abuse. Uh, the professor who was leading the experiment, it's quite famous now, he, he admits, he said, I lost it. I got totally caught up, just like the students did, playing the roles of the guards and the prisoners. He said the only way we stopped it was that my girlfriend, she was also a, uh, uh, a social psychologist at Stanford, she told me, hey, this is really <laughs> getting way out of hand. I think you should stop this. And she's, you know, kind of <laughs> woke him up. Uh, this is a famous experiment. Uh, it's been debated endlessly. It gives insight into how we're subject to situational forces outside of our internal determinants, and that these situations can actually play a major role in, in our life. Let's look at things from another point of view. The, when there's evil done, when there's, when there are Atrocious things done, we like to say there were a few bad apples that were the perpetrators. Perhaps it's better to look at the barrel that the bad apples are in. And then look at who designed the barrel. <laughs> this is what Krishna does in Bhagavad Gita. Human beings act in a certain way. Uh, besides taking into account their individual characteristics, let's consider the material situation that they're operating in. There's an energy of illusion that they have voluntarily participated in. And that energy of illusion is sweeping them along. So it's not just that they are mm, totally on top of what they're doing. They voluntarily dove into a certain river. In Sanskrit, the word is maya. Maya means that which is not what it appears to be. <laughs> you dive into the river of maya, and you're swept away into so many kinds of strange situations. And the strangest situation, from the viewpoint of yoga psychology, is we think we are matter, and we need matter to satisfy ourselves. This is a very bizarre uh, situation for the individual being from the viewpoint of Bhagavad Gita. <clears throat> we don't want to just pick on Stanford, let's pick on Yale now. <laughs> there was a very famous experiment done in 1971, the Stanley Milgram experiment, in which, excuse me, 74, after I graduated, so I'm innocent. So, <clears throat> Students were recruited to, all they knew was that they were being asked to participate in, in an educational experiment meant to help students to learn. So some students were sent to volunteer to um, answer multiple choice questions. And if they didn't get the right answer, 
another student who couldn't see them because the students answering the questions were behind the screen. Another student could press a button and give an electric shock. So the whole procedure was supervised by an erudite professor uh, wearing a white coat and assuring the student administering the shocks that I take full responsibility. You are not accountable. <laughs> It's all on me, and the purpose of this experiment is to get the person to learn. If they make mistakes, that's not good for their academic career. They should master these multiple choice answers, and you are there to help them, and you're gonna do that by administering an electric shock every time they give the wrong answer. 